Hi, we're in uh, uh, New York City at the Waldorf, and it's uh, it's uh, January 9th, and we have a whole room full of people here, and we have standing room only with three people standing. And uh, but MCA is very special, and to know MCA and the, and the advisory uh, magazine is to like it. And I've made the suggestion a number of times that if somebody could curl, if they, first of all, you have to have some interest in collecting and history. If you have no interest, then give up. But if you have an interest. You know, it crosses many different barriers, and uh, I'll make this offer. If anybody uh, in the audience is not a member of MCA and uh, and does not want to pay dues, I will treat you to one year and just see the treasure. So you can go and say that doesn't apply to my family because I have five of them here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. I was talking to Ken Brissett, who was at the, the who was fetted along with our own John Adams, and. Uh, I said, do you know about Metal Collectors of America? No. What is he? His editor got. What is it? <laughs> He'd never heard of it before. Uh, and then I was talking uh, uh, to uh, uh, his name slips for the moment. The uh, editor of the C4 newsletter used to be in New Jersey, and uh, uh, Ray uh, Williams. Ray Williams, an uh, erudite person. Hey, do you know about MCA? No, I never heard of it. <laughs> And I said, well, there's something missing here. And, uh, but, and by email to some people, including Skyler, I suggested maybe a cross-pollination, like if somebody, uh, and I guess this will happen, if somebody, if somebody belongs to uh, Early American Coppers, for example, or, or the Colonial Coin Collectors Club, CCC4, although I've suggested that if you had the Certified Copper Coin Collectors Club of Coscob, Connecticut, you could have like C9. <laughs> But if you belong to one organization, you know, by crossing each other's uh, uh, magazines, just say, okay, you belong to C4. If you'd like a free copy of, of uh, MCA Bulletin, uh, maybe an electronic version to save money, you can have one, and then vice versa. And the MCA Bulletin can say, like, if you want to learn about C4. Anyway, I'm putting, not like Dr. Weiss, who deals in esoterica and, and metals, or John Adams, who who knows, uh, 20, uh, knows 325 ways that Portobello was commemorated, I uh, decided to put together something popular, okay? <laughs> but, you know, esoteric is where it is once you get into it, you know, like, uh, so here we go, and uh, uh, we'll see how we do. This is, see this work. On the front here, <clears throat> this is the best picture you'll see. This is an Indian peace medal issued for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, during his administration, it shows uh, the Indian peace medals in general, which I'll say more, uh, tried to tell Native Americans that they would be really good if they took up things like agriculture. So you have an Indian chief there with a plow. Uh, but you have a baseball game in the background, and uh, that's one of the earlier, not the earliest, but one of the earlier representations of a baseball game on a medal. And if you look at it very carefully, you'll see a ship in the background, and. Uh, a residence of some sort. So almost any metal you could look at and uh, dissect it and write a, you know, write an article about it. If you wanted to save everything you could see, uh, who engraved this metal and how was it distributed? Okay, <clears throat> I'm from Wolfboro, New Hampshire, and General James Wolfe, uh, who is the hero of the Battle of Abraham uh, Plains in, in Montreal in 1759. Uh, against the French, he lost his life, and the French uh, person did too. And uh, so, <clears throat> our, <clears throat> our town of Wolfboro is named after him. And there's a General Wolf medal that I, I, it was in the Ford collection, and I missed it. I would like to buy it if anybody in the room owns it. I've never seen another. It's not listed anywhere, including in Bets, Bets which is the standard reference on it. But it shows the before Quebec, the Battle of Quebec, and. and uh, uh, Gen General Wolf, named Wolfboro, in 1759 our town was uh, uh, granted, and uh, they said, "What should we name it?" And, and General Wolf had just died recently, and said, "Well, how about uh, Wolfboro?" So it was named Wolfboro, but no one knew. It. General Wolf had never even been to New England, let alone New Hampshire, and so uh, this, this the E was dropped for like a hundred years, including on banknotes. We're in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. So if you look at an old gazetteer, like from 1855 or something, it said Wolfboro, New Hampshire, named for the ferocity and tenacity of its residents. <laughs> this is a John Adams special. Porto Bello uh, in Latin America uh, was uh, 
uh, captured by Admiral Vernon, and John has done, done the work on Admiral Vernon, the co-author. And he, <coughs> he, it says, who took Porto Bello with six ships only? And, uh, you know, Porto Bello was a Spanish fortification, and uh, it was supposed to be impregnable or whatever it was supposed to be. He asked, asked John, and, and, and Admiral Vernon said, let me out, take it. So with just six ships instead of a flotilla or an armada, he took it, and he was lionized. Uh, when he got back to England, they issued uh, thousands and thousands of medals and inexpensive, uh, this is probably brass, to commemorate the version. So many that there are many, many different dye varieties. And this is another instance where you could take a, a medal that's related to America, as, uh, that is the New World, and uh, uh, as John did, write a book about it. <coughs> George Washington, this, uh, this is the bust by Jean Antoine Houdin who visited Mount, Ver Mount Vernon personally in 1785 and did a bust of George Washington, uh, which was replicated many times over. Anne, do you have one in your museum? We, we have one of the plaster replicas. Yeah, yeah. we have Anne Bentley, who uh, for many years, 17 years, I would give a lecture at Harvard uh, every year on, on miscellaneous collectibles. I was their, their, their collectibles person, and, and I, 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 of course, for muse would-be uh, museum curators, so the last four or five years, I brought Ann Bentley, curator of the Mass Historical Society, as my exhibit A, you know, because she's a real curator. And then, then we had a question and answer session the first time, and I said, anybody have a question? And they, everybody had a question and answer. Well, wait a minute, I'm giving the program. <laughs> but anyway, Ann and I are great pals. Uh, Ann is a very good example of a museum curator, very rare actually, who uh, comes uh, from a museum that wasn't necessarily numismatic, and has become a superb numismatist, co-authoring with John Adams a book on uh, Amer Comici Americana medals. And this is a, your, the Houdin bust with translated into many, many medals, dozens and dozens. This is Comici Americana, that means American mm -hmm. Congress. And this is a Washington before Boston. That was made with a number of different dyes and uh, was popular in its time. Uh, Washington was venerated uh, even before he died. No one quite knew what he looked like. And here we have this, this medal made in France showing G. Washington, General of the Army, but they really didn't know what Washington looked like. So they, they just took somebody, whoever that happens to be, and, and called that a George Washington medal. And uh, that's, uh, there are several Washington medals with fictitious portraits. And things like this make uh, things interesting. It's relevant to say that if you were writing the Coin Dealer newsletter or something in 19, 1860, and what's hot in the market? The hottest thing in the market was Washington medals. Uh, you know, everybody wanted them, uh, and believe that today, I'm the average uh, reader of Coin World or News Bank News probably never saw one. This is the first Washington medal. Uh, this was uh, made in the United States and sold in 1790, uh, advertised in Philadelphia. The first Washington medal that was generally available to the public, and that's a picture of Washington. Uh, to the right, that's the obverse, and the left, it gives his uh, <clears throat> biographical information, General of the Armies, and when he resigned and then he became president, he was still living, and you could buy this in brass, uh, and which is uh, not too rare. Uh, there are two obverse versions, and the, uh, or in uh, silver and gold, and uh, but uh, I've never owned silver or gold. Uh, when Washington died in the Mount Vernon on uh, December 14th, he, he had, we didn't have any telegraphs or anything else, news spread, and, and here's the New York Gazette on December 29th, which is one week later. Uh, Columbia mourns in the deepest grief, and this is a typical newspaper article in a resolution of Congress on the passing of Washington. It, it, it really affect, it probably affected the United States like 9-11 affected us in our own uh, time. I mean, everybody mourned, and it was a change of anything everybody knew. Washington uh, was responsible for winning the Revolutionary War, and it was just a a uh, very uh, tragic and mournful time. And in Newbury Park, Massachusetts, uh, the uh, uh, Jacob Perkins, who is a, a die sinker, uh, made metal. He is in glory, the world is in tears. This is a gold medal, which is rare. They usually come in silver. And uh, these were these were distributed a hole at the top and uh, worn, sold widely. There are a number of different die varieties and uh, generally worn in parades. And on, on February uh, 22, uh, 1800, uh, uh, a couple months after his death, there were parades, Philadelphia, New York, and everywhere. <clears throat> a lot of people 
wore these silver medals uh, with little strings or ribbons around their neck. This is one of the most famous of Washington. Uh, but every medal has its uh, satire, and this is the Eccleston Medal. This medal is a, a very large diameter. Uh, I, I don't know the exact diameter, let's say 75 millimeters or something. And uh, it venerates Washington, General Washington, inscribed to his memory by Daniel Eccleston. Eccleston was sort of a Donald Trump or something. Very you know, outspoken, lots of opinions on everything. Uh, he was a British, British person. And uh, so he's, he's exalting, uh, he laid the foundation of liberty and so forth. Innumerable millions yet unborn will venerate the memory of the man who obtained their country's freedom. But in the middle, we have a disconsolate Indian saying the land was ours. <laughs> So it's uh, like a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot, but you know, and uh, here again, the study of metals, uh, you get involved in things like this, and this is something you, anybody here could, who likes uh, Washington could write an essay about. There's a lot of, uh, Eccleston put out other medals too. This is 1805, which is a little late, a little late for a Washington commemorative medal. The uh, mid cabinet, uh, as I said, in the uh, uh, in 1860, Washington Mills was the hottest thing going, and the, the Mint uh, with, uh, 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 with James Ross Snowden uh, set about collecting as many Washington tokens as the medals as possible. Uh, Snow, uh, Snowden put out a book on Washington medals, and this is the Mint cabinet with a bust of Washington on top. Uh, it doesn't look like a Houdin bust, but a bust of some sort. And then on four sides, you have Washington medals arranged on a little ledge and then people can come around the walk around the railing and look at them presumably there probably was a, a guard on hand and you have the obverse which is the Dan bust uh, executed by Anthony Paquette who was an engraver on the mid staff uh, going away from uh, Washington we, there's a, a large series of medals which uh, Ann Bentley and uh, uh, John Adams are written, uh, written about Kamisha Americana this is a a restrike of one, but uh, it, it John Paul Jones, who uh, was sailed out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as you probably know. Uh, and uh, the idea is Congress wanted to commemorate uh, important things in American history, uh, American revolutionary history in particular, and uh, commissioned medals to be made. And uh, this is uh, one of a whole series of medals. Each one has its own story. And there's John Paul Jones in action there against the with a ship. Uh, this is a, uh, what is a medal is a, uh, a good question. We talked about that in the recent issue of MCA advisory. <coughs> there doesn't seem to be a, a uh, definition. We have tokens, then we have thing, uh, things that are bigger than tokens, then we have medals. But generally speaking, a medal is something that doesn't have a face value, doesn't have a trade value. It's not good, good for one uh, cup of coffee or anything. And uh, size, does matter, and uh, there's no definition on that, but something like this is probably called a metalit, and a lot of the uh, uh, Admiral Vernons are too. They're uh, usually between maybe 22, 23 millimeters up to maybe 31, 32 millimeters, and uh, they're called metals. This is a metal, a very mysterious metal. Uh, believed to have been put out in uh, Holland, but a lot has been written about it. It's also listed in the guidebook under Colonials, and it shows the Amer that's Narragansett Bay looking like uh, whatever it looks like on the right. Uh, uh, and then you have uh, ships on the right full of Americans and, and then uh, American troops uh, during the revolution. And the, on the left of the outburst it says Blood Penda, which means fleeing in, uh, in Dutch. And uh, then they, they removed the Blood Penda from the dyes and most of them don't say that anymore. But this is a, a medal that today not everybody's sure who issued it, where it was, where it was issued, why it was issued, and how it was distributed. Yet it's been listed in the guidebook for many, many years. This is probably the most famous medal of all in terms of the American uh, American series, the uh, Libertas Americana. Uh, was commissioned by Benjamin Franklin, who was in Paris, and he commissioned uh, uh, it to be made. It was struck at the Paris Mint, and it shows uh, liberty. Wear it with a liberty cap and, uh, on the back. The liberty cap was the ancient uh, symbol of freedom. When a, when a slave was freed in, in, in uh, ancient times, they would put a, uh, him or her, give him a cap to put on his head, setting him free, or her free, probably mostly him. 
that became a symbol of, uh, uh, symbol of freedom. Many American cities had a liberty pole right in the middle of the town, a tall pole, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet high with a liberty cap, just a liberty cap in the top of it is a symbol of independence. On the right we have, we have uh, uh, Britannia uh, being mauled by uh, the baby United States is in the foreground there and the British, uh, which, which Britannia is being attacked and, and uh, showing that uh, Britannia, Britain has uh, uh, failed uh, and the cause of uh, liberty and freedom has prevailed. And this medal is, is fairly common. There are probably uh, upwards of one or two hundred in, in uh, copper and uh, uh, you know, a few dozen in silver, and the Paris Mint today makes a very beautiful restrike uh, in, in mirror proof you can buy. I think you can buy them. I bought, uh, bought some a few years ago that are really worth having if you uh, want to own a nice impression. This is a miscellaneous metal. Uh, no particular significance as far as metals go, except that it's, it was an admission pass. You, this metal shows uh, Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, who had uh, Peel's Museum in Philadelphia, uh, and uh, you put put this in your pocket and uh, uh, carried it with you, and you could go in the museum free. Uh, Wilson was very well known in his time, and eventually, uh, Charles Wilson Peel, as you probably know, had children named after artists like Titian, and Rembrandt, and so forth, that were all skilled in various things. But uh, Peel uh, was a museum curator at a museum in Philadelphia. Then uh, the family opened one in New York and one in Baltimore, and uh, in their own time, they were very well known. This is one of my favorite medals. This is uh, your medal, I believe, Anne, your picture. Uh, this is what, probably my most fa my favorite early medal, and I mentioned this at MCA Advisory. In 1787, the two ships left Boston, the Lady Washington and the Columbia. The uh, Lady Washington was a small sloop shown to the right, they went on a voyage of exploration up to the Pacific Northwest, and it shows the people in the back who sponsored this, sponsored this the dive, and they took with them some Massachusetts copper coins uh, to give away, and it shows, uh, there's a sketch at the upper right showing them in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with George Washington, but if you collect Washington medals, it says it Lady Washington, but. Uh, it's often listed under Washington medals because Washington is mentioned, but there are probably uh, uh, two dozen of these in, in uh, uh, copper in existence and then uh, a handful in silver. Uh, I got my first one from John Adams who bought it from the, uh, bought it from the Garrett collection and then he upgraded and I bought, I bought uh, his and then I upgraded mine. Uh, now I have uh, three of them. I have one in uh, two in copper, and there are a couple little variations. But this is uh, actually a book on the voyage of the Columbia was written by a man named Howey. Uh, you can spend all weekend reading it, and there's another example of how a medal can open the door to uh, lots of interest. Uh, Indian peace medals are a separate category, and here we have uh, Chief Red Jacket. Uh, chief Red Jacket uh, was an Indian uh, chief and it shows him wearing this medal. This particular medal is hand engraved. Um, this is the Indian Peace Medal. Uh, the, this medal still exists, and it's uh, owned by the Buffalo Historical Society. Uh, there are only a few uh, Indian Peace Medals hand engraved that, that do exist. There are a number of copies, but uh, this original, if it were sold, it's not being sold or anything, but probably bring it into seven figures. And that was uh, uh, a, partnership named McKenney and Hall put out a series of portraits of Indian chiefs and many of them, a number of them have Indian peace medals and this is uh, probably the key, the key one. Here we go back to more Indian peace medals. Uh, the idea, the white man, uh, Anglos, wanted the Native Americans, the Indians, they were barbaric and whatever they wanted to be called, to become cultured. So the Indian peace medals uh, often had signs of culture. So this is a, a medal made by Conrad Kukler in England, uh, dated 1796 for the George Washington administration, but actually it wasn't delivered till later. So, so the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition, the, the uh, Corps of Discovery it was really called, from 1804 to 1806, took a supply of these along. And we have, at the left, we have um, the home. It shows Indians, uh, it tells Indians, gosh, you know, 
if you had a nice home with a little baby or something, that's contentment. Then we have the farmer in the middle, which is sometimes called the sower, uh, planting seeds, a very nice non-warlike thing to do. In the right, we have the shepherd. There are three obverses, and they all have a common reverse. And these are uh, existent copper and silver, and they're classics uh, for anyone specializing in early metals. Uh, there's the uh, Indian peace medal I showed on the cover. Uh, uh, this is uh, from a by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the idea was that uh, the different presidents issued Indian peace medals to give to different tribes around the United States. And of course, the Indians or Native Americans became fewer and fewer numbers. And as I think, probably John Adams, but someone writing about Indian peace medal, uh, Pruka, uh, possibly. They issued these through the late uh, 19th century. And, Someone wrote in and said, I'm a good Catholic, I go to church, this is an Indian. Can I have an Indian peace medal? Okay, here's one. <laughs> so they became sort of, a, you know, they, they, they became sort of diluted. And of course, the, the, the aggressors were not the, were the unpeaceful uh, United States Army anyway. This is one of my favorite medals, anybody's favorite medal. This is the uh, opening of the uh, of, of the Erie Canal, it opened in 1825. In 1826, uh, uh, Charles Cushing Wright put out a medal and it shows the uh, goddesses of sea and land on the left and then the American eagle and a half globe. And uh, these, these medals, mostly in silver, but white medals exist, white metal copies exist. This is about the size of a silver dollar, or maybe a half dollar. And they were, the a ship, call, uh, a ship called the Seneca Chief uh, the first ship, I think, on the Erie Canal, they took wood from it and made little wooden uh, presentation cases. And the, at the upper right is the lid of a little presentation capsule uh, that was given with the medals, and these were passed out in New York City. Uh, this is Christian Gobrecht, one of the uh, most uh, famous medalists, maybe not for, uh, you know, in terms of esoterica, but in terms of of the United States Mint and elsewhere. And he, uh, in 1836, they uh, had the first steam operated press at the Philadelphia Mint. And they uh, scheduled a ceremony for February 22nd. February 22nd is very important in, in history. It's George Washington's birthday. And very often, if they could celebrate anything uh, in the early, early in the year, they did February 22nd. So at the lower right, we have a medal that says first steam coinage, February 22, 1836. But there was a problem. The, the press wasn't ready, so they made some medals and probably threw most of them away. Or, uh, and then uh, they overdated it on the top right with March 23rd, which is when it did take place. They cut the one date over the other. And uh, uh, the obverse uh, the medal shown to the left there is the Liberty Cap, which has many antecedents, probably uh, best known in the uh, uh, coinage of Mexico. but. Uh, the Liberty Cap with a glory of rays around it was a, a popular uh, icon at the time. In 1836, actually, the Philadelphia Mint and uh, Gobrek made a, a pattern gold dollar with that mug heat. And those are those are two uh, two more Gobrek medals, the one to the left and one to the right, silver award medals uh, done private commissions to different organizations. And you can see how ornate they are. You can take a magnifying glass and see the tiniest of tiny details. Uh, and uh, making uh, Gobrecht, you know, very famous in his time. And even today as a mint graver, I'm not saying that uh, he was the very finest, probably, uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, others could give him a run for their money. Uh, but uh, the, certainly numismatically, he's best remembered. And we have the Gobrecht, uh, Liber the Gobrecht Journal put out by the Liberty Seated Coin uh, Club. Uh, Elizabeth Jones, the last chief engraver we had, uh, but was probably super artistic and probably could have uh, competed with uh, Gobrek, but in the modern era they didn't have such complicated classical uh, metals that explained everything when you looked at them. It, metals told stories and each of these metals tells a story. Uh, this is one of my favorite metals. This is the uh, New Haven Medal of 1838. Not too well known, but uh, the, the, the obverse shown to the left shows uh, uh, shows uh, the first uh, Reverend uh, John Elliott preaching to the Indians uh, in Quinnipiac, later uh, New Haven, 
and it's signed by, there are two outburst dies, uh, this one's signed by C.C. Uh, uh, Wright to Laura Wright. All, this particular scene was also shown on a banknote and I sh in yellow, uh, and I showed that. And here's the reverse of the same medal. It shows a New Haven, uh, home of Yale University and other such uh, uh, things, uh, and a real scene on the left with the New Haven common, common but on the upper right, they took all the buildings and compressed them together and put, it, put the river there. And it shows the buildings, but not in the right order. And uh, this medal was uh, very well known in its era. Uh, a lot was written about it, but then it almost became completely forgotten. You know, it was too late to be uh, listed in, in certain medal references. And uh, anyway, when digging into it, as I, ha I have uh, done, and Neil Mlisanti, who's in the room, has done too, uh, some are others. It has a really fascinating history to it, uh, how they issued it and how it was designed and, and, uh, and more about it. This is a medal we sold uh, at auction for I think $400,000 or something a few years ago. Uh, it, it's uh, by C.C. Wright honoring uh, Zachary Taylor in the war with Mexico. Uh, it's, it's not only a gold medal, which is rare, as it's out, rare uh, in itself, but the first shipment of gold, official shipment of gold from California was brought to Washington, D.C. by a special emissary and arrived in December 1848 and was sent to the Mint. And the Mint made some quarter eagles out of it and then took the rest of it and made this gold, one gold medal. So this is from native California gold. And uh, here again, right, this, you could take a magnifying glass and, uh, and uh, study the Battle of Buena Vista and show all the troops and everything. And this also would have told a story. Uh, this is close to my heart, uh, Central America, because I was involved in the original uh, uh, distribution of all the stuff in the Central America. Uh, and this is a, a ship that left uh, uh, left uh, Aspinwall in Panama, heading for New York City, uh, with a, a, a lot of gold ingots and coins aboard and other things. Got caught in a hurricane in a year of when they didn't have weather forecasting, uh, was sunk on uh, February, excuse me, sunk on uh, uh, September 12th, 1857, and, uh, Saturday at about eight o'clock in the evening with, Cap, with uh, Captain Herndon, Herndon, Virginia is named after him, by the way, Captain Herndon going down with his ship in the best naval <coughs> tradition, and uh, 400 people were killed, and uh, the treasure was recovered in the late 1980s, as some of you know, and it's probably the probably the most sensational numismatic discovery. Well, maybe the silver dollars of the Treasury Department were give it competition, but uh, certainly one of the most uh, spectacular numismatic events of the past, shall I say, 100 years. Um, we have Augustus B. Sage, a teenager, who in uh, March 1858 brought some friends together in his apartment at 121 Essex Street, upstairs family apartment, and formed the American Numismatic Society. Uh, he was a, a teenager, he liked coins, dealt in coins, and was a school teacher. And he decided to put out a series of medalettes, uh, and these are called odds and ends, like a, a describing history. So the first one he did was when the, on October 5th, the, the Crystal Palace in New York, which was opened in 1853 and uh, managed by P.T. Barnum at the beginning, uh, burned down. He decided that was a good thing for a, a news news type medal. So he had uh, George H. Lovett cut the dies, and on the back, all his vanity it comes from uh, Ecclesiastes. It means like all mankind's achievements are really mean nothing in the long run. A little philosophy there, but here again, uh, it just shows that collecting a medal, you could write a uh, you know, uh, I could probably if if uh, if told to do so could talk a half hour about this medal. Here's another one in this series. This shows Paul Morphy, and Paul Morphy was a, was sort of the Tiger Woods of his day, except that he was doing chess, and, and all, the, all the newspapers would have chess columns in them, all the Metropolitan newspapers, and Morphy was a hero. He uh, was chess champion. He went to Europe, and he's at the top right. He shows them facing away from uh, seven different chess boards and beating seven different uh, chess players. And he, he uh, wiped out all the chess champions of continental Europe and in England, except there was one who wouldn't play with him. 
uh, play against him, and uh, so the, the Odds and Ends medal commemorates Murphy. This is a pretty rare medal, by the way. Uh, I, I, I've been interested in, in Sage for many years, and I probably have only ever seen one or two come on the market in the past 15 years, believe it or not. If one were to come on the market, it probably wouldn't be worth much. I'm just guessing it'd be worth $200 or something. But it's super rare. We point out another thing about metals. If you know what you're looking for, uh, when it comes up for sale, unless it's something famous, chances are that it won't cost a lot of money. I mean, for the price of an 1893S Morgan Dollar and MS65, you could build the, maybe the nicest, the fourth largest metal collection in America and have hundreds of pieces in. This is P.T. Barnum, one of my favorite characters uh, in American history. Uh, he uh, issued a medal of his uh, American Museum at the upper left, and there it is the museum. Uh, two days ago, my family and I stopped in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where they have a P.T. Barnum Museum, which is open from 11 to 2 in the afternoon on Thursdays and Fridays. <laughs> uh, and the main museum is closed. That, believe it or not, it was damaged by a tornado, of all things, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. But they have a very nice exhibit with a docent who can call and tell you about how Barnum started and everything. And uh, well worth visiting. It's free. You, uh, you're supposed to give a donation, which we did. But Barnum, uh, <coughs> Barnum was uh, the master. He, he brought Jenny Lind to America, and he had Jumbo the Elephant. And uh, uh, he uh, said people love to be humbug. They like to be fooled. And uh, uh, and I guess, of course, uh, you know Walt Disney humbugs people if you go. If you go to uh, uh, Orlando, you see a fake pirate ship and you see presidents standing up or whatever. And famously, he said, every crowd has a silver lining. Uh, then, he, then according to tradition, uh, there's a sign saying, to the egress, which means exit. And if you went out the egress, you found yourself in the street. I'm not too sure that's true. But what is a, a, is a sucker born every minute is attributed to a Barnum, but I'm sort of a semi-Barnum scholar. And there's nothing original. No, no one ever said that until modern time. It's sort of like when I was doing some uh, research on uh, Henry Clay. It said, Henry Clay said, I'd rather be right than be president. And someone else said, well, you're not going to be either. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, when did Henry Clay say this? You know, Henry Clay was in the 1840s and so on. So I look it up, and, and it was first put in a book in 1895. <laughs> so it had nothing to do with Henry Clay. But these, leg these legends endure like a, who has had the first uh, bathtub in the White House? Uh, Wolcott Gibbs or somebody wrote a satire, about, a serious satire, I think it was in New Yorker, about the first bathtub in the White House, completely fictitious. <laughs> and that still lives today. Uh, this is the first medal issued uh, for the Civil War. This is the bombardment of Fort Sumter. This was cut, this medal was sold, uh, the bombardment took place in April, and this medal was on the market by May, showing the bombardment done by George uh, Love it and sold by Augustus Hay, uh, Sage in white metal and copper and in silver. And uh, there, are, there are dozens, hundreds of medals on the Civil War. This is the very first one. And this is a very good example of, of if you found the copper one, most people don't know this is the first medal of the Civil War. I don't think there's any place you can particularly look it up. It's not in Bob Julian's mint medals. So if you know, if you want one and you keep your eye on Joe Levine's priceless or somebody else's uh, you know you if you buy one my, my guess is one is three hundred dollars or something you know even though they're not, not very many in existence and that's a large diameter metal uh, this is a, a typical metal metal this is an award medal for the American Institute the American Institute was a trade organization based in New York City uh, and what they did is they invited people to uh, set up at a trade fair. It was held in for a while in the uh, Crystal Palace uh, from 1853 till it burned down in 1858. In fact, when it burned down, it was going on that day. It was still going on. But the idea was that you would uh, bring a product to the American Institute. Uh, you would register it. You could, it could be like a new type of tablespoon, a new type of watch, a, a new type of uh, uh, apple peeler, whatever it was. It's sort of mechanical or artistic. And then it would give you an award. And if you won the first, you got a gold medal that you could enter every year. And if you won like two years, the second year, third, fourth year, you got a little a paper certificate saying gold medal. <laughs> they didn't give you a gold medal once you won one. This was, uh, uh, what date is this? 1855. And, and that's uh, 
one of the more famous, uh, one of the relatively few collectible gold uh, award medals of the uh, 19th century, mid 19th century that you can get. Uh, often these trade at, at gold value and uh, probably this has a market value of I'm making this up $1,600 or something. You know, it probably has a meltdown value of $800 or something. Uh, here we have the, uh, uh, I have a very personal connection. This is the World's Columbian Exposition Award Medal uh, with uh, the obverse by Charles uh, Morgan and the reverse by Augustus St. Gaudens. They didn't get along very well and uh, St. Gaudens uh, once said that uh, Chief Engraver's uh, art artistic talents were wretched. <laughs> <laughs> which is a nice thing to say, but anyway, they de they designed the medal, won the obverse and won the reverse. This is the award medal for the, the Columbian Exposition was supposed to open in 1892 to observe the 400th anniversary of the quote discovery end of quote of America, not that it had been lost, but things but things that were delayed didn't open to 1893. The award medal for 1893 wasn't ready in 1893, it was ready, ready a couple years later. This is an award medal given to uh, uh, Mr. Lachman of Germany, who uh, brought to the Columbian Exposition a uh, musical clock. It has three music box discs in it. I have a personal tie to the Columbian Exposition. My, uh, uh, my uh, great-grandmother, uh, Frances Muma, was a juried uh, oil painting and water painting artist who had five paintings at the Columbian Exposition listed in the catalog. Then she exhibited at the uh, Trans-Mississippi Exposition in uh, uh, Omaha, and then 1904 at the Lewis at the Louisiana Purchase. So I, was telling my grandkids over there that the, their uh, part of their DNA is one thirty second of this uh, of this artist. Uh, but anyway, here's the obverse and reverse of the medal. And I'll show the back of the medal. Okay, there's the clock I have. It's in my front hall. This was exhibited at the Columbia Exposition. I won this medal. It says Fabrique, That means factory of Lachman. Uh, Lachman sure. Uh, in German, like it means Lachmann's factory. It's a that's a uh, music work, a music factory. Actien Gesellschaft just means cor corporation in Germany. So this particular medal was awarded to Paul Lachmann and for the Columbian Exposition for this specific clock. Uh, Eroica is from the music piece of the, the music uh, composition, same name. So this is sort of my when I think of the Columbian Exposition, I sort of have a, a nice personal connection to it. Uh, the clock itself is pretty rare. Uh, this was sold by the Lachman family through Sotheby's in London, and uh, that's how I wound up getting it sort of second hand. Going more into the modern era, this is more or less chronological. We have another class called Assay Commission Medals, uh, which were uh, first put out uh, years ago in, uh, in the uh, 1860s. And uh, they, every year they put out an Assay Commission Medal, usually in copper uh, with silver also. And this is 1901. Uh, with the, observing the opening of the uh, third Philadelphia Mint. And there's pictures of mint there. And the metal, the obverse of the metal the upper left shows the mint from a different angle. And here again, not to become repetitive, but any of these things, you know, if somebody said, uh, gosh, I need an article on uh, whatever, you could take this and probably look it up. I'm not too much on Wikipedia because most of my research was done the hard way, like filling out call slips in the Library of Congress and everything. But uh, I, I love Wikipedia today. I list it as a credit the things I do. But I mean, you, it's much easier to write an article now. And uh, that would be a good study. Uh, this is uh, the Louisiana uh, Purchase Exposition. At the upper right, we have a, a, a it, sa it says, uh, silver metal. Well, of course, they didn't want to spend money on silver. <laughs> so it says silver metal. But it's really in brass. Uh, and that's sort of, uh, it's sort of funny. And, uh, then I was at the uh, Philadelphia Mint. Uh, I go there pretty regularly, but a couple of years ago, and I was talking to uh, uh, my good friend now, Phoebe Hemphill, who designed the, the New Hampshire uh, uh, National Parks Quarter. And in her in her in her uh, desk there at about seven Graver, there's this little big galvano of this metal, and I uh, in original. And I said, "What is this here for?" Well, I just liked it. I took it out of the archives. I put it in my office. So uh, anyway, this is a, uh, a medal. And these, here again, these medal, this medal, uh, I, I don't want to overdo Joe Levine or Paul Bosco, people that sell medals today, and others do it also, eBay. 
Uh, but a metal like this probably would not cost more than $100 or so and would have a nice story. Uh, this is one of the uh, most controversial metals ever. On the left hand side, uh, upper left and, and lower, we have the official inaugural medal done by Chief Engraver uh, Charles E. Barber, which I really don't think is all that bad, I think. Uh, but uh, Teddy Roosevelt just said it was a piece of trash, and he privately commissioned Augusta St. Gaudens, who didn't like Barber, to make a private medal, which is shown to the right. So, you, and, and uh, if you were to ask metal people, oh, the St. Gaudens medal is wonderful, and the, the Barber medal is terrible. Well, I think they're both nice. I mean, if, if I were jurying, I would maybe give an award to the Barber medal. But anyway, uh, numismatic tradition is such that the right metal is worth, the right side metal is worth over $10,000, and the left hand metal, which is probably equally rare, uh, is worth probably in the hundreds of dollars. Just an interesting, uh, interesting commentary. Uh, we have the San Francisco, this is a, a metal put out in 1906. In San Francisco, we had the earthquake and fire. Uh, usually in San Francisco history, it's called the fire and earthquake. The fire was more damaging. And a medal put out in 1906 showing this cliff house in San Francisco, which survived, but it didn't make it for very long because the next year at the upper right, it caught on fire. So uh, I suppose you could say this is a commemorative medal now. But I like, I like things, I always felt with a medal, uh, if you take a medal uh, as item one and you take the history of the medal as item two, and you put one and one together, you get four. Uh, and here again, uh, you know, you, you could have this metal all by itself, you could have that by itself, but put them both together, and they become a very rich story. Uh, here we have one of my favorite characters, Audrey Munson, and left, she, she's posing nude. Uh, Audrey, uh, a number of years ago, I was doing research for the Thanhauser Film Company. I like film history and wrote, wrote a book about it, and. Uh, which is online now uh, for the Thanhauser Company, and Audrey Munson was one of their actresses uh, doing research in New Rochelle, New York, not too far from here, 45 minutes from Broadway. Anybody know about New Rochelle? Anyway, it's a town here. It's 45 minutes from Broadway. It's where it was sort of the Beverly Hills of, of, uh, of New York in, uh, 100 and some years ago. George M. Cohan in 1906 wrote a, uh, st a story called uh, 45, uh, a song, 45 minutes from Broadway, but what a difference it makes, and they had people cho chewing on hay stalks at New Rochelle, <laughs> it's a complete satire. But if you go to New Rochelle now, the railroad station says, 45 minutes from Broadway. <laughs> when I was doing research, there was a lady named Mariette de Cristina who had worked for the Evening Star, and I hired her, as I often do, for $10 an hour to poke around New Rochelle, including with me, finding old buildings and everything, and today she's executive editor of Scientific American. So I'm very proud of her, although I had nothing to do with her becoming an uh, executive editor. But anyway, Audrey Munson was a Sanhauser actress, and uh, she put out, uh, she put out uh, a uh, movie called Inspiration, and, and this isn't pornographic, and it showed her as an artist's model, and she was completely nude uh, in the movie. I haven't seen the movie, I don't know if it exists, but you know, uh, front, back, and sideways, <laughs> Uh, but all in the name of art. We have an a, a art uh, director there, a sculptor not paying attention to art, but wanting to be sure she poses correctly, uh, assuming, we assume that, and, uh, and she's posing. But the, the, the connection is that Robert Aitken, A-I-T-K-E-N, a sculptor from uh, New York City, medalist, who uh, uh, came from San Francisco, used Audrey to model nude for the medal he did for the Pan Pacific Exposition. And the two girls on the right reverse, uh, two of them are modeled from Audrey Munson. And, it, and in the newspaper articles at the time, it said that Audrey, the famous model, she was very well known, the famous model Audrey Munson modeled for our medal. But uh, so uh, I decided to put this picture in because knowing it would increase the audience or something. Uh, here we have a medal that shouldn't have been a medal. Uh, the North American uh, uh, Centennial wanted to have a coin, and I guess they wrote to the men or didn't have the right connect, uh, congressional connections, and they said, uh, oh, have a medal made. So they had a medal made. Of course, they had a coin made. It'd be famous. The medal was made at the mint, and it's still, you know, pretty well known. But uh, there's sort of the saying, if you really want to sell a lot of them, make a coin, not a medal. But uh, anyway, that's a 
one of the more famous uh, American medals of its era, uh, and uh, usually seen in silver, is here. Uh, the Society of Medalists is something that everybody should get involved in. David Alexander, where? Raise your hand, Dave. Where are you? Uh, David uh, was doing a doing a uh, study of it, and then I sort of. Uh, I think I sort of helped prompt the American Mathematics Society, but hey, th this is deserving of a book. So David put out a book. The only problem with the book is it cost, what, $150 or something? <laughs> I mean, it should cost, they should have a paperback edition for $29.95, but, but this, 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 if you're at all interested in metals, you should find out more about these. The typical, uh, the typical Society of Metalists, the first issue came out in 1930, and they went to different medalists, uh, and they, they said to the medalists, uh, you can design the obverse and reverse, anything you want. You know, normally a medalist says, okay, I want a medal depicting my great-grandfather, I want one showing my building, I want one whatever. They never, they never said do whatever you want. So we have uh, dozens of artists, two a year, putting out medals on whatever they want to. One of them shows a house fly, another one shows a, a saying saying like in the, peacetime, uh, uh, sons bury their fathers, and wartime, fathers bury their sons, and different things. This uh, was medal number 27. These were sold by subscription, uh, usually in brass. Sometimes they were antique. And in silver, I have a complete set of these. These are not very expensive. You can actually buy them for like $50, uh, yeah, <laughs> because no one knows about them. And they're not all that common. There might be a few hundred of, them, of some of them. But here we have uh, Anna Huntington Hyatt, who is the wife of Archer Huntington, who uh, was a uh, scion of the uh, of, uh, Railroad to the West uh, and uh, a grandson, a, uh, a adopted son, who had unlimited amounts of money and in 1906 built the American Numismatic, financed the American Numismatic Society Museum. And uh, he liked Spanish, Spanish coins, but his wife is an accomplished artist, Anna. And so she was told, do whatever you want to. And this is an African water hole. And uh, each, each uh, uh, metal tells about who they are. And uh, uh, that she, they also found that Bro Brook Green Gardens, if you know where that is, in uh, South Carolina, which is a, a sculpture, metal uh, sculpture garden now, and uh, uh, left along a large, they didn't have any children, left along a, lo a long, uh, legacy of art and metallic sculpture and regular sculpture. Uh, here is a uh, Laura Garden Fraser, and at the right, she and her husband <coughs> uh, did the uh, Oregon Trail thing. So when she was told that she could do a, a something for the Society of Medalists, for some reason they she sort of adopted the reverse of the Conestoga wagon, and then the obverse is uh, as she it says ten days, whatever I can't quite read it, but. Pony Express. The Pony Express only lasted for about a year because then the Telegraph uh, was in effect, I believe, in 1861 and the Pony Express in 1860. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's uh, another Society of Medalists. Um, here we have uh, uh, Don Everhart. Don Everhart is a super genius. He lives today. Uh, he uh, is a sculptor, an artist sculptor, they call him, at the uh, Philadelphia Mint, and I took a picture of him there. And uh, this is the late Society of Metalists, where you know you can do whatever you want. So he said, so he has one of, of a dinosaur, and it's a weird shape. If, as you probably know from metals, uh, you know you have everything ex that range that today look like uh, paperweights, uh, uh, ashtrays. <laughs> you know, metals have gotten a little off track. But uh, anyway, Don is a super talented person and uh, a fine acquaintance of mine, and that shows him at the mint holding a mint product, not a Society of Metalists. Uh, this is one of my favorite metals. Uh, this is the toilet seat metal. And if you know anything about Louisiana history, you'll know that uh, Huey Long was multiple governor of Louisiana for many terms. Uh, he ran an uh, empire. If he wanted somebody to go to jail for life, he would send them. If he wanted somebody executed, <laughs> he would command they be executed. And in 1932, he was elected a U.S. congressman. He was a very oafish person, swore a lot, uh, threw his weight around, and uh, uh, was a friend of Roosevelt's in 1932. But by <clears throat> but a few years later, uh, 
came, started his own political party with the motto, every man a king. In other words, we'll take, if you have any money, we'll take it from you and we'll give it to everybody. Uh, you know, sort of like Mr., uh, what's his name from Vermont today. Uh, but he was a drunk and in Sands Point, Long Island, attending a function with 600 people. And uh, uh, he went to the toilet and the toilet was being occupied, so he peed on the pant leg of the person occupying it. <laughs> so the person occupying it took it his head and bashed it against either, depending on what account you read, the a wa wash basin or the toilet. So the Medallic Card Company decided to put out a medal about this, and it says, by, by public acclaim for a deed done in private. <laughs> and uh, so they have a gold, they have a, made one was striking in gold, and uh, they asked, uh, Huey Long, would you would you please accept it? And he said no. So they gave it to the American Numismatic Society, <laughs> which now has it. Uh, but this is a, a, one of my favorite medals just because that's a nice story. And here again, I don't know what one of these sells for, but probably between one and two hundred dollars. And they're not common. I mean, probably not more than one or two appear on the market per year. And uh, Lu uh, Louis, uh, uh, Huey Long was called the Kingfish, and that explains the uh, Motif. Uh, this was a medallic venture by Abe Kossoff, Abner Kreisberg, and Robert Friedberg in 1946 in the United Nations, and they decided to put out this medal for the Four Freedoms, and they in silver, and they made a couple of gold, and they wanted the, the United States to mint to make them, and then they wanted the, uh, the United Nations. They, the project never got anywhere, uh, but this is a, a medal that again has history the year after World War uh, II and. Uh, one of my good friends, Oscar Schilke, was president of the New York Numismatic Club, founded in 1908, first meeting in 1909, and they put out a medal of each president. There's one of David Alexander uh, in the room here, who was a past president. Uh, but Oscar was a very fine friend of mine in the 50s, uh, old timer, he knew, uh, he, he knew Wade Raymond and Thomas Elder and all this stuff, and uh, uh, was a good friend. I'd visit him in Connecticut, and that's that's a uh, medal they put out for him. That, here again, that's probably rare. They're probably one in the market every three years, and probably the market value is less than $100. We're getting near the end, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a medal, of, this is my badge from the, my first ANA convention in 1955. I wasn't old enough to belong to ANA, I had to be 18, so they gave me a Porsche table by special dispensation if my father would guarantee that I would be honest. And this is the convention badge medal very attractive one that I got at that time. It has a hanger. Since then, I've gotten a bunch of other medals. Uh, this is an award medal for a book I did from the uh, Token and Metal Society in 1975. I was uh, Speaking of medals, I was the founder of the Token and Metal Society, and I think they're only, maybe the only other living person as a founder may have been, maybe uh, uh, Cliff Mishler, I'm not sure, but uh, that was a long, long time ago, but to me it seems like yesterday. Uh, there's my fine friend, uh, sculptor Frank Despero, and we asked him, the company asked him, will you design a medal uh, depicting yourself, whatever you want to do? So he designed his own medal, Frank Despero, uh, at his easel creating a medal. And so that's a, a medal of, uh, 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 that's the fact that a mismatist wrote a, a def quote, definitive end of quote, and all, all uh, uh, Frank Espera medals about two or three years ago, but they didn't know about the long series of medals he did for us. So it's not mentioned. Okay, uh, this is a, 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 I could call this a medal, you could even call it a token, uh, but it, it depicts a Moxie horse mobile at the lower left. That was very famous. Moxie in the early 20th century outsold Coca Cola in New England. And uh, I like Moxie. I wrote a book on Moxie, and I have, I've co owned the only Moxie horse mobile in existence, shown to the right on view at uh, it's a LaSalle, 1929, at Clark's Trading Post. I don't have a place to put it, but it has a horse on the top of it, and a steering wheel, and you drive it in the parade, and it, 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 uh, uh, it used to advertise Moxie. The only, one, the only one remaining from about 16 originally made. This is uh, Deja Vu uh, 10 years ago here at the uh, Waldorf. We had a, a gala, which uh, I was honored. John uh, Adams told me that he suggested that he suggested A&S do this, so I thank you again, John. And they made a medal of me uh, by Alexander Shagan, and this is a, uh, I could, I was asked to design the medal, and I said, well, I like mirror-proof finish, I'm old-fashioned. Uh, so can you make it mirror-proof? And on the back, uh, uh, Uta Wartenberger said, we should have a classic. So uh, Shagan uh, 
I'll put an owl showing wisdom in the little leaves of the American Numismatic Society. And there's a, a, a classic scene from ancient Greece, which Shagan did, and, and did a trial piece of it and sent it. Udi said, no, that's not, that's not right. The, the classic little thing is right. So she redesigned it. Whatever it happens to be is what she uh, changed it. So that's one of my favorite, favorite things. That's uh, listed in the ANA, but it's still a book of ANS medals. Uh, which I don't have a copy of yet, I have to get one, but it, apparently it occupies a page there. That was a, a memorable event, and uh, here again, that was 10 years ago uh, this week. And here's the last in the series, uh, Metals Up to Date. This is also by Shagan, uh, very con a very talented person for our own society here, 2012, Metal Collections America. I don't know uh, who suggests the theme, but uh, I presume they suggest it to Alex, and Alex executes it. And, uh, so far, I have uh, one of each medal, and that's it. Okay, thank you.